When I was a kid, I loved doing adventurous things. I liked to go climbing and hiking and exploring. And when we were younger, uh, we always went to Colorado for two weeks. We did a two-week thing in Colorado every year. And it was just fun to go exploring and hiking and go all over the place. And so when I was young, I had the energy to do that. But now that I'm older, I don't quite have all that energy. In fact, last year, um, last summer, Lisa and I went uh, on a little vacation. We went out to Colorado, and we decided we were going to go on a hike. So we were just going to take this little hike. There was a waterfalls up there, and there were lots of people hiking. And we said, Let's, it's nice. It's Colorado. It's beautiful. It's in the afternoon. It's in the cool of the day, kind of. And let's just go on a hike. So we take off and we are hiking and we go and there's a waterfall at the end of this trail. And so we started hiking and started walking and it was, a, it was beautiful. It, it was really pretty. And then we, we didn't see the, the waterfall, but there were people coming down and going up and people passing us. And of course, I was staying kind of in the back and letting her go in front. That way I was protecting her from any dangerous things that were coming behind. And she was going ahead and I was kind of bringing up the rear. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like when, when Chris and Lauren Capsey go out hiking. Uh, he's dragging and she's the one that's wanting to go forward. So that's kind of what we were doing. Well, we just kept going and there's still no waterfall. And I know it's up there because people are coming down and we're going. And finally, we just said, how much farther is it? Oh, it's not too far. It's just, it's just, it's just right up here. How many of you know that some people's it's not too far is different from other people it's not too far, all right? Us, out of, or me, out of shape people from Oklahoma, we didn't have, we didn't have the tools. Uh, I had on a pair of boots, and I had on a shirt and shorts, and we weren't really equipped to go on this hike. I started out with a, with a thing of water, but I threw it down. I, it, it was heavy. <laughs> you know, it, it, the bottles of water can be heavy when you're tired. So we kept going, and finally there was another guy that comes down. And I asked him, how much farther is it? Oh, it's just not too far. It's just right over the hill up there. I shouldn't have listened to him. He was in flip-flops and had a child on his back in a carrier. I mean, these guys are crazy. But it was the adventure. We kept going, and there were several times that we wanted to stop and turn around and go the other way because we still couldn't get there. And we almost did. We almost just said, okay, let's forget it because... It, I don't know where it's at, and I'm exhausted. It could be another five miles. I don't know. I think we've gone 20. I think we had, but it was maybe only one, two. Okay. But anyway, finally, we, we got up to the waterfall and got to see the waterfall, and we relaxed, and then we had to go back down. So, but it was just, it was, it was grueling to us, you know, because we just we almost gave up too late. We almost gave up before we got to the very top. And I'm so glad that we didn't because we got there. You know what? Sometimes, you guys, when you have something that you're trying to achieve, when you have a goal that you're trying to set out to have, when you have an adventure that you're going for, sometimes it's easy to get on that journey and be all excited about it. But when you get about halfway up there, you just give out. You're tired. You don't know how much farther it is. You don't know how much energy it's going to take. And after a while, you just get weary and you want to set down. But I want you to know this morning, there are people who have gone before us who didn't give up. And the reason we are where we are today is because people did not give up that went before us. People blazed the trail. People were pioneers. People didn't give up on the adventure that God had laid out for them. And I want to encourage you this morning... Don't give up on what God has put in your heart. Don't give up on the dreams that he's put inside of you. Don't give up on the hopes because I want you to know something. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. One person can make a difference. One person can make a difference. John Maxwell, a few years ago, wrote a book called Running with Giants. In the book, he talked about different Old Testament characters and talked about what would it be like if we could sit down and talk with them for just a few minutes. What would their conversation be like? What would they say? What would be the theme of their conversation? And I love the one he said about Noah. He said, Noah would say this. He would say, one person can make a difference. One person can make a difference. I, I don't know if we would recognize Noah because he would be a guy that would be uh, fairly old looking. He would be a guy that was probably stooped over a little bit in what he did, but you could look at his face and see that 
He knew what he was talking about. He had experienced some things. And I say he was a little old looking. He would be older than we've ever seen old look. Because if you'll go to the scripture, you'll find out that Noah died when he was 950 years old. He died when he was 950 years old. He started building the ark when he was 500 years old. He didn't even start having kids until he was 500 years old, all right? I mean, this is, this is a long process for him. Back then, I don't know if the food was better or what the deal was, or maybe they ate all organic, I don't know, or you know, cage-free or something, I don't know, but they lived a lot longer. And here is Noah, and he is an old man, but he has great wisdom in what he says. And the thing that he wants us to know is that this, that one person can make a difference. I love this portion of scripture in Genesis, the sixth chapter, and it starts with the fifth verse. Let me read you just a little bit about what God is saying about that generation and, and how this story of Noah comes into existence. In verse number five, it said, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and had every inclination of the thoughts in his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move above, along the ground and birds of the air. For I am grieved that I have made them. Here's the kicker. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So you're familiar with the story. I mean, every kid grows up learning about Noah and the ark and the whole process of a flood coming and everything being consumed. But God found favor in this young man, Noah. He was young for what we're thinking, but this man, Noah, God found favor in him because there must have been something that he did that was right. So what I want to do is I want to talk about how one person can make a difference this morning. And I want to talk about this story of Noah. And just kind of set in here, if we were talking to Noah and we were listening to what he said, I think he would say some of these kind of things. The first thing I think Noah would want us to, to understand is that you can make a difference in your family. You can make a difference in your family. We read this scripture here that just said that he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. If you'll flip over one more page here, to chapter number seven, it says, the very first verse says, the Lord then said to Noah, go build an ark. Uh, hang on, let me, yeah, go build an ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. He, he said to Noah, listen, I'm gonna destroy everything in the earth, but I'm not gonna destroy you and your family because you are righteous, because you have found favor in my eyes. In other words, You've been obedient to what I've asked you to do. You've lived your life to a degree that other people see it. And not only am I blessing you, but I'm gonna bless your whole family. You see, folks, what we need to understand this morning is that when we choose to live a life that honors God, it blesses not only us, but it blesses our whole family because now we are setting the precedent. We are setting the standard for what our family believes and how our family is directed we are making the decision that I am going to go this way, my family is going to live a certain way, and this is how we're going to live our lives. And can I tell you, it's not easy. That would have been a good place for an amen right there. It is not easy. Because all around you are people who are pulling you away or people who are trying to tear you down. All around you are people who are trying to knock you off of the perch that you think that you're on or that they think that you're on. Amen? Is that the truth? Not only is it people outside, but it's people on the inside. Because nobody wants to be around someone that they feel or perceive as doing better than them or more perfect than they are or has it all together better than they do. If they can knock you down, if they can bring you down to their level, it makes them feel more comfortable in what they are. But can I say to you, in this generation and in this culture, there has to be some men and women and some teenagers that can stand up and say, I choose to live a life that is honoring God in everything that I do. I make this decision to do it. All right, we got a lot of people leaving. 
Could we reduce that? Can some of y'all help me with some of them kids coming in and out and reduce some of that so that we can stay right here and stay real focused, all right? We love having them in here, but stay still. So it's important for us. If we could sit down this morning with Noah, I think Noah would probably say something like this. Don't be afraid to stand out in a crowd. Don't be afraid to stand out in the crowd. Hey, loneliness sometimes happens when the people around us reject us. Loneliness happens sometimes when even family members reject us. But what I want to focus on and what Noah wants you to understand this morning is that you can't be afraid to stand out in the crowd to be the single person that says, I'm going to go this direction. I'm going to do what God wants me to. Though none go with me, yet I will follow, as the old song says. I have made this decision. I'm going to go this way. And popular culture can't pull me away from it. Pressure can't pull me away from it. I am determined I'm going to go this way because everything in life is going to pull you away from it. But can I say, as a father and as a mother, as the leader of your household, there is everything coming against you to keep you from going the way that you feel that God wants you to go. Television comes against you. Our culture comes against you. Our school system comes against you. The neighbors come against you. Your kids' friends come against you. I don't care how protected you make your kids, how close you keep them. You can stop all the television. They cannot have any phones. You can do all that kind of stuff. They are still going to hit that. They're still going to get the influence from the outside coming in. We have to, as adults and as parents, make that stand with our family that we are going to go this direction. We are going to serve God with everything that we have. We are not going to be freaks of nature, but at the same time, I'm not going to bow to what society thinks I should bow to. I'm going to put my heart towards God and let him be the one that directs me and changes my path if he chooses to change it. Amen? Are you with me this morning? Are you with me? So I think that that's something that he would say. Listen, God can use pressure in our lives to make us better. God can use things in our lives that come against us. It's iron sharpens iron. It's a, it's a, it's a piece of sand in, uh, under our saddle or, or in our shoe. It helps us become the men and women that we're supposed to become. Bad times sometimes develops great character. God used loneliness to develop aloneness with him sometimes because if we are the people that are always lonely, it helps us develop a consecration and a communion with God that we could never develop in a crowd. Sometimes you need to pull away from the crowd and get alone with God and let him speak to you. All right, I, I'm gonna amen myself if you guys don't start amening me here in a second. Here's the second thing that I think that that would be important for us to know. Number two is that you can make a difference for future generations. You can make a, few, a difference for future generations. What you do today, how you live your life today is affecting not just your family, but it's affecting future generations. I've had men and women that I've grown close to in our church and I can ask them, tell me about your Tell me about your life. Tell me about your relationship with God. We had one guy here that was a deacon in our church, and every time I would say, tell me about your relationship with God, how you came to Christ, or tell me about your Christian journey, he would always say, my mom, he had started with my mom. She taught Sunday school. She ran bus ministry. She went to prison ministry. She went to nursing homes. She would take people in. She made food for people who came back from the service. I mean, she, he just went, oh, everything was my mom, my mom, my mom, my mom, my mom. Did all this kind of stuff. And I wanted to say to you, well, how about you? How about you? What are you doing that's making a difference in the world? Well, my mom did this. My dad did this. Grandma and grandpa, they pastored churches. They did all this kind of stuff. Well, what about you? They did that. We're riding on their shoulders we're enjoying the reap, we're reaping their harvest. But I wanted to ask you something. What are you doing for future generations in your life? What are you doing for your children and your children's children and the people who are coming after you? What are you doing right now in your life to take care of them? If we only live in our lives to take care of me today, to make me happy, to make me feel good, but here's what the devil will do. He will orchestrate it in your life that the only thing in your life that makes you happy is the only thing that will also destroy you. People who are in drugs and taking drugs and, and are, 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 are chemically dependent, whether that's alcohol or drugs, either one, the only way they can feel good about themselves is to take more. But the thing is, is the more they take, the more destructive it makes them. 
It's the same thing with other stimulants, with pornography and other things. The only way they can feel good about themselves is to indulge more, but it's the indulgence is the thing that destroys their life. At some point, you gotta pull out and say, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing it for another generation. I'm doing it for those people who are coming after me. I wanna blaze a trail for another generation because that's selfless living. That's selfless living. I heard the story of an old man who was planting some apple trees. They were just little small little small seedlings that he was putting in the ground. And the young man was watching him do that. He was preparing the soil and he was getting everything right and he was putting the trees in. And the young man came up to him and said, I noticed you're planting these trees, but it takes years for them to grow. Surely you don't think that you're ever gonna live long enough to enjoy these trees. And the man says, no, I realize that I'm not, but I'm planting these so that someone else can enjoy them. I'm planting this tree so that some, another generation can enjoy this. You know what, you guys? The things that you're doing within ministry today, you're planting seeds that another generation is going to come reap the harvest of it. The life that you're living with your children and the life that you're living at work and the money that you're investing in ministry and the different things that you do in life, you're investing for another generation to come enjoy that you may never see the benefits of it, but there's going to be another generation that's going to come behind you that's going to reap the benefits of what you're doing. And it's important for you to understand you're making a difference in the generations that are coming behind you. If we ask Noah, Noah, wh wh what do you think about this? I think Noah would say something like this. Don't be afraid to do something for the first time. Don't be afraid to do something. Don't be afraid to take a risk. Don't be afraid to jump out there when no one else wants to jump out there. Don't be afraid just because you don't understand what God's telling you to do. Don't be afraid to step out there and do the things that he was asking you to do. Many scholars say that before this time of the flood, there was never rain that came upon the world. In fact, if you jump back to Genesis, the second chapter, the fourth verse, it says this, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. So we have some other scriptures that will allude to this, but what many scholars believe and theorists believe is that, that the, the way that the earth was, was replenished and the, the water came, it, it came up from the ground, it came from the dew of the ground, it came and replenished, the streams were replenished by water that came up and, and there wasn't a concept of water coming down. So when God first said to Noah, I want you to build an ark, a, a what? An ark. It is going to be big, okay? It's going to be big. If you want to know the rough dimensions of it, if you've ever been over to Cityplex Towers or City of Faith over at 81st and Lewis, if you know what I'm talking about across from ORU, those three buildings are actually, Or Roberts, when he built that, he built one of them to represent the, the length of the ark, one of them to represent the width of the ark, and one of them to represent the height of the ark. He built those three in that dimension. And there, there is a place here. I know some of you have been to visit. There is actually a place here in America where they have actually built a replica of the ark according to these dimensions so that you can actually walk in it and get an idea. This was a big cruise line. This was a big boat, all right? Big, really big boat. And God said, I want you to make this. And at that time, Noah had never even seen rain. So he has got to obey God and do something for the first time that nobody else has ever done. Sometimes God may call you and ask you to do something that your family, your generation has never done before. Pray for Thanksgiving meal. Pray over your Christmas meal. Pray an Easter meal. Do something with your family that your family's never done before. Don't have alcohol this, this holiday. Do something in your family that they've never done before. God may call you or ask you to step out in your family and make a stand in some way, in some form or some fashion. And I just say to you, if you feel that God is asking you to do that, don't be afraid to step out and do what God is asking you to do. I'm glad that Noah didn't say, listen, God, that's never been done before. We can't do that kind of stuff. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you want me to do. You've said this, but this doesn't make sense to me, so I'm just gonna pass this by as if, you know, I, I'm just not catching what you're saying. But he was willing to obey what God asked him to do, and it made a difference in the world. It saved the world. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, because what you're doing is affecting future generations. Number three, number three. 
Here's another thing. You can make a difference for God. You can make a difference for your family. You can make a difference for next generations, but you can make a difference for God. Now, let me stop and settle something real quick. God doesn't need you, all right? God doesn't need you. God is whole. He's complete. He's self-sufficient. He's self-sustainable. He doesn't need mankind to make him feel good or to do his work. He doesn't do it. He is complete all by himself. That is the immutable God. That is who he is. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but God chooses to share his ministry with you. God allows you to be his representative to the world. God does some of his best work through the, through the corruptible, messed up lives of imperfect people. I know none of you are like that in here, but there are some people out there that are broken and have made some bad decisions in life. And God does some of his best work through those people because what he is doing is that we become a replica or we become a reflection of the grace of God to the world. When God can look at my life and see the mess ups that I've made, when God can listen to the things that I say that I promise and I never come through with, when God can look at the things that I've gone through in my life and say, there's one I can still use because he's not interested in our past, he's interested in our future, and if we'll step out and ask God to do it, he will use us. God needs us. God needs us to be his representative to the world. Let me take that back. He doesn't need us. God chooses to let us be his representatives to the world. And that's a powerful concept. God wants to use us. We can make a difference for God. We can be his representatives to the world. No would say, don't be afraid to obey even when you don't fully understand what I'm asking you to do. Don't be afraid to to obey. You know, sometimes I wonder... God, is this you asking me to do something or is this just me thinking it up? Well, stop and say, well, what is it that God's asking me to do? Well, if God's asking you to give something, it's never the devil telling you to do it because the devil doesn't ask anyone to give. He asks people to take. He's the one that says take from people, take it. He He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God's the only one that'll ask you to give or put that upon your heart. And if God asks you to give, or if it's not God and you just think, I need to give, then do it because God's going to bless you. He will honor the choices that you make. If God asks you to step out and speak kindness to someone or give a cup of water in his name or buy some water for someone who's on the street or reach out and be kind to someone or pay for someone's meal at the, at the restaurant when you see somebody else. Maybe I've gone in and I went into a restaurant one time and there was a family came in with five kids, five kids. You know anybody with five kids, Shelly? Anybody? (laughs) Came in with five kids. Yeah, five five kids. And the mom looked like she was with it, but the dad was beat down, you know. (laughs) He had he had carriers and he, I mean, he was just beat down. So I I came in and I was laughing because it was just funny. The kids were all over the place. And I said, been there and done that. We only have four, but it felt like five. Here's the thing: I raised four kids, she raised five. So I, yeah, I know she likes that. She likes it. So I asked to pay for their meal, and uh, and I did. But I know, you know, a family like that, they're not going to eat. They're not. They're not ordering steak. You know what I'm saying? They're ordering one meal and then spreading it around. No, that's I didn't take that in consideration. But I just asked to pay for their meal, and so I paid for it. I told the guy, don't don't let them know. Just let me pay for it. And so I paid for it. Went up to the front, and before I left, the father came up to me, no lie, with tears in his eyes, and says, I don't know who you are but thank you for buying our meal. And I said, you know what? I've got four kids of my own. I know what you're going through, but I just felt the Lord put it in my heart to buy you a meal. It it was something small. It didn't, it didn't, it wasn't anything big. It was, you know, 20 or $30. I can't remember what it was. But what God was asking me to do was step out and be a blessing in someone else's life. I have no idea what that man was going through, what that family was going through. But I do know this, that when I'm obedient to God, he brings people that are obedient to bless me. And I say that because I've had cars given to me. I've had people give me blank checks with their signature on it and say, I want you to pay off all the bills that you have. Just put whatever amount you want. I'm going to pay off all your debt. I've had that happen twice. God, amen. God has been faithful. We've given away vehicles. We've given people things. 
We've blessed people with things. Why? Because if God, listen, if God can't pass it through you, he's not going to give it to you, all right? If I grumble and complain about all the money that my wife has always given away to people, well, then God says, well, okay, well, I can, I can solve that. I just won't give you all any more money. And I say, no, 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 give it. If she wants to give it, let her give it. Lord, you've always taken care of us. As you can see, I'm not starving to death. I'm well fed, probably better fed than what I should be. But what I know is that if God asks you to do it, step out in faith and believe that what he is asking you is the right thing. Amen. Y'all, I'm getting a little more energy, all right? I'm getting a little more energy. They've got my clock messed up back there, so I'm going to have to see what my real time is. Okay, I got five minutes. They started it too late. I know they did. And the last thing. You can make a difference at any age. Listen to this. You can make a difference at any age. Paul, I'm talking to you back there. You can make a difference at any age. Any age. It don't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. I, re- I talked about that just a second ago. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came over the earth. He was 600 years old. I don't know what your excuse is today about why you're doing what you're doing or not doing what you're not doing. But I want you to know something that it doesn't matter how old you are, God can still use you. If Noah was here today, I think he would say something like this. Whenever you see a rainbow, remember that one person can make a difference. Whenever you see a rainbow in the sky, remember One person can make a difference. God can speak to one person and he can change the world. God can speak to one person and she can change the world. God can speak to one child and he can make a difference in the world. God can speak to even the old man. This guy was 600 years old. There's not a one of you in here that's 600 years old. Some of you are close. I'm looking at Merle over there. Some of you are close, but none of us are even that close. But God still chooses to use us For his glory and his power, he chooses because he knows that he can use imperfect people and no one is past that prime age. No one is. Listen, David was 12 years old when he defeated Goliath. Noah was 600 years old when he built the ark. His sons were around 100 years old themselves when they started building an ark. This was like a senior citizen's cruise ship. They just piled all the old people on here and sent them out with all the animals. But God can use the craziest things to do his work in the world. So I don't care where you come from, how old you are, how young you are, how insignificant you feel that you are. God still has a purpose and a plan for your life. Listen to this. I don't care how sick you are. I don't care how beat down you are by other people in your life or in your family. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter how much money your net worth is. All that matters is are you willing to do something for God and to step out into an area where there's not going to be anybody else around, but you're going to have to step out in this new adventure that God has for you. And you may feel all by yourself, but let me tell you, if God is in it, He's in it to win it. You're going to get taken care of. He's going to take care of you. I heard a a report about a church that was full of old people. Kind of like this one was when we took it. Merle, you you were back there back then. Full of old people. The pastor tried everything he could do to motivate those people and get them going, and just nothing worked. They couldn't get any young people to come to the church. It was old and everything was old and the church was old and they couldn't keep up with the payments and the repairs and all the things that were going on. And this pastor tried his hardest. He couldn't, he could, it just wasn't working. For years, he tried to get new people in the church and he was exhausted. Finally, he just quit. Can't do it. it. Hey, believe me, we do feel like that sometimes. We do feel like quitting. I had a guy text me last Monday and say, hey, hey, are you still serving Jesus? And I said, don't ask me on a Monday. Ask me on a Friday. I, Friday's my day off and I'm better. You know. But this pastor quit the church and he, he went on into another area and he, he just couldn't do it. But he was left just these few handful of old people in the church. But they, they had a vision. They had dreams that they wanted, their, they wanted a church that their grandkids could come to. They wanted to make a difference in some form or fashion, but they didn't know how. 
So one of the older ladies in the church, her son was a high school principal. And she said to her son, hey, I don't know if you have any kids at your school that ever just need to talk to somebody. Maybe they don't have a grandparent or parents or whatever, but I don't know if they would just be interested in talking. I'd be interested in, in, a, in talking with them. Back then, they didn't have social media, so she said, here's my phone number, and if, if they're interested, I would be glad to talk to them. So they had an assembly, and the principal passed out her number and said, if any of you guys are just at a place, you just need someone to talk to, uh, this is my mom. And she said she would just love to talk to any of you guys if you just needed someone to talk to her. She's not going to come to me about it. It's just going to be between you two, just if you guys want to do that. So we sent that out to a student body of probably about five or 600 kids. That afternoon, her phone started ringing. And after she'd get off with one kid, she would get on with another. And she would get on with another and another. And the phone calls went almost all night long. So she said to her son, we got to do something. So they got a, a second line put into there so they could split the calls. And she had some of the other ladies from the church that would come over to her house after school. And they would sit. And for hours, they would, they would pick up phone calls from kids. The kids were calling back every night. They were reporting what's going on. They would talk with these kids, pray with these kids. She didn't have enough people to do it. So she asked other people from the church to come. Now they got the thing routed to the church. So in the afternoons, the, the ladies and the men would come to the church and they would just answer phones. And they started inviting these kids to come to church. And the kids came and they would get saved at the church. They still didn't have a pastor. Finally, they got a pastor to come. And this pastor started a youth group. And you know what? The church began to grow from these teenagers that came into this church and just wanted someone that would be real with them, someone who would love them, someone who wasn't interested in getting them in trouble, but someone who just wanted to care for them. These ladies would make sandwiches for them. They'd come over after school, and they developed a ministry, and a church began to grow because one old lady said, just maybe if I gave my number out, God could use it. Let me ask you this. If God could use one old lady, what could he do with you? What could he do with you, with your degrees, with your abilities, with your professionalism? What could he do with your training? What could he do with your experience in raising your kids? Because that's not easy. What could he do? I just want you to know, God wants to do it. If we will be willing to step out into the new adventure that God has for us, one person can make a difference. Amen. Bow your heads with me, would you please?